Mullet was a bread and butter fish for Cortez. You used to see we had mullet and grits for breakfast. We had grits and mullet for lunch, and we had leftovers for supper. So <laughs> we were pretty well versed in that little creature you call a mullet. She failed McGillis. My name is Thomas R. Fulford. Live in Cortez, Florida. I'm 78 years old and I've fished all but 13 of those years. When I was big enough to slip into a pair of shorts and run down the shore, I was there and I had an uncle who was one of the most outstanding fishermen, I guess, in the state of Florida, Walden Tink Fulford. He sort of took me under his arm to make a fisherman out of it. And every time I went down there, he, was, he would give me something to do, teach me something to do, how to fish, I mean, how to mend net, how to spread net, how to hang net, how to do everything it was to do to a net. So I just started learning at a very early age. I got big enough to where I was, could go out on a crew and earn some money. I went with him. He was a good teacher, but he wouldn't talk. He expected you to watch him and to learn from what he did. He gave me a pocket knife and a mending needle. And he said, no, when you learn how to use these, you can go fishing. So <laughs> that's, that's the kind of a fellow he was. Technology goes a long way. It started out with oars and then it went to sails and then it went to power engines. I didn't see any of the oars in any of the sails. I got there when it's time for the power engines. Of course, I pulled a many a mile. That's how we use these skiffs. We had to propel them with what we call pulling oars. And and that was done with your shoulders, and I guess that's why you saw me wince when I just <laughs> I just moved my shoulder. Well, I've done this 10 million times, and that's not exaggerating. When I was growing up, I used to sit on the, my mother's front porch and watch those fishermen walk up and down that shell road with that tin bucket in his hand. And in that bucket, he had a cold biscuit and a cold piece of mullet. He carried that fish to him. That's what he ate till he come back in. If he wanted to sleep, he slept in the rain or slept under a piece of canvas. Sometimes he didn't get to sleep. But sometimes you could run your net and had to wait for the tide, you know, and things like that. And you'd have time out and get to sleep. He had an old hard board to sleep on for a pile of wet net. When I came along, that was gone. We had comfortable clothes to wear. We had weather protection gear to keep us dry and warm. We had dependable boats and motors to take us where we wanted to go. We had bunks on our boat. We had stoves under the canopy. I always have hot coffee and bacon and eggs and grits if you didn't want to eat a mullet. It was an independent lifestyle. You went when you want to and the rewards were directly proportional to the effort that you put in it if you wanted to work hard. And I did. I went day and night. It was a good life, a, a real good life. I remember one old fellow used to tell us, he said, boys, you think you're going to get rich, but you won't. And sometimes you think you're going to starve to death, but you won't. You know, and really, what more can you ask? When you have food and clothing and are there with content, that's real contentment. Music was one thing that brought people together. It seems like every afternoon, Especially on the weekend when those fishermen home, you'd step outside, you'd hear guitars and fiddles. 
floating from, I don't know, seemed like you could hear them from a mile away. And there was one guy had an accordion, and everybody would just start gravitating towards that sound of that music. First thing you know, you'd have 20, 30 people in somebody's front yard climbing up on their porch, listening to all that music, singing. And it was great around here, and every once in a while we'd have mullet and grits. <laughs> that made it that much better. 1987, uh, lost this leg on a boat, and people asked me uh, if they thought that was the end of my career. <laughs> and in 14 days, I was back in the boat catching fish. <laughs> uh, no, it's not. I'm just getting started. I never knew how to make a cast net. I can't, still can't throw one. I never have caught a fish in one that I know of. But in 1995, we had the net ban. Took the nets away from the commercial fishermen. It's like taking the scalpel away from the doctor and say, all right, you take this little rusty pocket knife and go in there and you take that fellow's appendix out. It's like giving somebody a cast net and say, all right, now you go feed the world with that cast net. Uh, it, it won't work. And I said, Sonny, you're going to have to have a cash flow here somehow. I said, there's a lot of people now who are going to want these cast nets. Hey, you can't throw them. You better learn how to make some cast nets. <laughs> so I had a brother-in-law who had been doing it for a long time. He'd retired from shrimping. And he went to making cast nets. And I called him, asked him if he'd show me how. And he said, yeah, and he showed me how. That was in 95, and I've been making them ever since, and never have had anybody bring one back to me and say it wasn't any good. They didn't like it. In fact, I've pat my own back. I've heard nothing but praise for my cast nets. They said, if you want a cast net, get Blue Fulford's cast net. Nobody knows how to fish now like they did 15 years ago. I'm just... One of the few that's left who could get the network going again, like it was. Of course, there's always change. And someone would find a way to do it some way, but not the old-time way, not the way that we used to do it, not the way that was, works well for a century down here in Cortez. Like I say, my time at the wheel is already past. All I can do now is make cast nets for these people who, who are allowed this limited activity. <laughs>